Yeah. All right. Glad that you are here tonight. I hope you had a great day. We had a wonderful day at God's house yesterday, and uh, we started off the week right, I know. And so glad that you are here. I want to open us up in a word of prayer, and then Steve Hack will come and share and do some introductions. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for what you're doing in this church. We thank you for how you are blessing beyond measure. God, we just want to hear from you, and we pray for tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would speak and that we would be able to discern and then be able just to follow you in absolute obedience, Father. We thank you for this time together. Thank you for what you're doing, and we give this time to you tonight as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'll stand here as well. Um, Jack, thank you for opening us up and, and for that prayer. I appreciate that very much. Um, it's my privilege tonight to introduce Dr. Tommy Gray, who is the lead pastor at uh, Asbury Church of Madison. Uh, before I say tell you a little bit about him or his background, you know, we had some requests from people in our membership, people in the congregation, as a part of the discernment process uh, to try to decide the direction our church should take when we come to the point of, of having to vote on that issue. And, of course, there were some who said, we don't know very much about churches who have chosen the independent route. We don't know much about that. Uh, can you bring somebody in to talk about that? Uh, we, we've heard about this um, network called the Foundry, but we don't know much about that. Uh, can you bring somebody that maybe can talk about that? So that's what we're doing tonight, hopefully, and I'm not, if I step out of bounds, he'll, he'll bring me back, I know. But um, hopefully we'll give you information and give you a chance uh, at, at the close of his presentation uh, to ask questions uh, and for him to hopefully be able to provide answers. And uh, maybe you'll have a little better feeling or feel like you're a little better uh, educated about that uh, when the night is over. For those of you who are not familiar with Asbury, uh, it was a United Methodist Church, but its membership voted overwhelmingly, something in the 90% to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. And it has chosen the path of remaining independent uh, since it disaffiliated. Now, Dr. Gray has served 40 years of pastoral ministry and has also served as a district superintendent and a director of church planning in the United Methodist Church. He has been a delegate to two general conferences and has also been a delegate to numerous jurisdictional conferences. Dr. Gray is, is best known, and some of you will know, and I'm not sure what that is, maybe it's me. Dr. Gray is best known as the founding pastor of Clear Branch Church in Trustful. For those of you who are familiar with that church, I, I am. And he served there as, for 12 years as a pastor. Dr. Gray received his bachelor degree from UAH, a Master of Divinity degree from the Memphis Theological Seminary, and his doctorate of ministry from the Asbury Theological Seminary. Uh, he's married to Carrie. They have two children and three grandchildren. And I am just thrilled that he was able to come tonight, and uh, I know that you're going you're gonna to receive some help uh, receive some information that will be of use to you. Thank you, sir, for being here. Well, good afternoon. Is this mic on? Yeah, there you go. Well, don't leave it that loud, so that's good. Well, it's my privilege to be with you. Just a couple things before I jump into my presentation. First of all, just so you know, my goal is to be 30 minutes or so, uh, maybe less, and then we'll just fill questions. So that's, that's my goal. I've done a number of these presentations primarily for churches who are trying to decide if they were going to disaffiliate or not. 
And I've started all those presentations the way I want to start this one. I am not here advocating for anything. I want you to know that I don't know you, your church. So I couldn't put myself in a position to advocate for a position. What I can do is talk about our process at Asbury, why we landed some of the places we landed, some of the decisions we made, and then just field your questions. And hopefully that will help you in your discernment process. And if it doesn't, well, that's okay. We've just spent a little time making some new friends, right? So that's our goal. I will also say this. Uh, I may actually uh, do something that I would never do in a moment like this, and that is look at my phone. And I'll tell you why. My daughter is having a pretty extensive knee surgery as we speak. It's the second one on her knee. She played basketball and all that stuff. And so I'm expecting an update that tells me everything's great. So if I look at that, just know I'm not being as rude as it might look. I just want to find out about that. Okay, so um, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to just kind of jump in with a little bit of kind of our story at Asbury. And then I'll talk about what a network looks like and then we'll field questions. So uh, some of my background in uh, you know, having been a delegate to General Conference and seeing some of the things, I believed uh, that we were gonna move in the direction we moved pretty, pretty quickly. So in January of 21, I started meeting with our leadership, our core leadership, and we began preparing for what we thought would come, which was I believed we would not have a general conference. I believe we would have a jurisdictional conference, and I believe we'd kind of end up right where we were. So we took the entire year of 21 to meet with what's called our executive board and our executive staff. That's about 15 people for us. At the end of that process, we handed off a recommendation to our administrative board, and after uh, a few months of uh, looking at that, we went toward a church vote, and uh, we had a church vote I think May 1st, something like that. And that's where we made the decision to disaffiliate and become an independent church as a part of a network. Now I want to, I'll talk about the word independent this, this evening, but I want you to know I kind of hate that word. You know, I have a love-hate relationship with it because as Westlands, I don't think we really believe in being independent. But if you move in this direction, that's technically what you are, and you have to function that way, but I think you need the benefit of relationships, okay? So here's what we did. We, we looked at three options. We narrowed it down to three options that we believed all would be viable for our church as we disaffiliated. We looked at the Global Methodist Church. We had Keith Boyette, who is, uh, at that time, was the head of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, now is leading the Global Methodist Church, and he came and spoke to our leadership. We looked at the Free Methodist Church. We had Bishop Keith Cowart, who is the bishop of this area of the Free Methodist Church, and he came and spoke to our leadership. And then we had Brian Collier, pastor of the Orchard in Tupelo and a multi-site church and the first United Methodist Church of size to disaffiliate. Brian's a good friend, and he came and presented something similar to what I'm presenting to you. And our leadership began to discern between those three. And here's what I will tell you. We believed we could have been happy and fulfilled and you know, could have leveraged our influence as a leading church in any of those areas. We believed that. We believed that all were traditional Westland, all were solid, all those leaders were people of integrity. We had no qualms with any of them. But we did have to begin to assess between the three what we thought were strengths and weaknesses of all three, including the one we chose. So let me just kind of map that out for you pretty quickly. The Global Methodist Church, we felt like the strengths were that it was most similar to what we'd always known. It's closest to the United Methodist Church, so it felt very familiar. Uh, at that point in time, it was actually the only option most of our church had even heard of. So we knew that had a lot going for it. And quite frankly, it allowed you to maintain the most relationships. 40 years of pastoral ministry and leadership in the church, a lot of deep relationships. And those don't just go away if you go another direction, but they change, they shift. And so, so those relationships would have been maintained uh, stronger. The greatest weaknesses we saw were really two. One, the highest apportionments uh, at that time. 
they were saying anything up to 10%. I believe now it's 2% and may land around 6.5%, but I would just encourage you to do your homework and understand that. For Asbury, when we disaffiliated from United Methodist Church, our yearly apportionments were $550,000 a year. So that mattered to us, right? The amount of money we had to send somewhere else really made a big deal to us. So that was one weakness. And second of all, we believe that had the highest bureaucracy, including the credentialing of pastors. And I really believe that's pretty significant to the recruitment of next generation leaders. So that was kind of our leadership's assessment, strengths and weaknesses of the two. The Free Methodist Church, uh, the strengths were accountability with low bureaucracy, and there was an easier credentialing process. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Chris Aletson, who's one of the pastors on our staff, Chris has had some seminary, and in our conference, she could be a full-time local pastor, but in the Free Methodist Church, she already had enough to be an ordained elder, which she chose that route. She's still on our staff, but she's an ordained elder in the Free Methodist Church. And at some point in time, we'll likely make a move to a, to a free Methodist church. We bless that. We believe every pastor, leader, church needs to kind of discern where they're going. And so that's just an example. In the United Methodist Church, she could be a local pastor. In the free Methodist Church, she could be an ordained elder. Lower apportionments for large churches in the free Methodist Church because they cap their apportionments at 180000 that's not as big a deal for smaller churches because you're gonna probably pay about the same amount if you're a small to mid-sized church, but as you get larger, that becomes an issue. And we felt like it had a strong vision. Uh, holiness, the power of the Holy Spirit and social impact. Free Methodist has to do with free pews. Back in the day when Methodists sold their pews to the highest bidder, the front, if you, if you were the wealthy folks, you sat down front, I jokingly say today we'd sell the back pews. We'd get more of the back pews. <laughs> but free pews, free spirit, wanted the Holy Spirit to be free to move, and free people stood against uh, slavery and all, all the things that came along with that, which is one of the reasons it's kind of weak in the Southeast. That's just one of the real. But we believe in that heartbeat of Wesleyanism, which is personal and social holiness going together. So we saw that as a real strength. Weaknesses, there are really few churches in the southeast. At that time, uh, there were two in the state of Alabama. Now there's three. You might have heard of the third one, Frazier, you know, pretty big one. You may also know that Chris Montgomery was our executive pastor when he was tapped to be the lead pastor at Frazier. And so he knew kind of the plan we were doing. He ran that plan for Frazier. It led them to the Free Methodist Church. It led us to a different place, you know. And he's an incredible leader and has done a good job there. For some of our, um, and so for some of our folks, the fact that there, there are fewer churches in the Free Methodist Church made it feel like recruiting new pastors might be a little bit of a challenge, might be, might be a tough thing. For some of our folks, it felt small and not well developed. Uh, one of our leaders, uh, said it's kind of like stepping back in time for them rather than stepping forward. I would say I didn't feel that, but some of our leaders felt that in the process. And in third, it was just not well known. Okay. Now, the network. What are the strengths of a network? Well, you're networked with similar <laughs> kingdom minded churches that we believed would have a greater opportunity to really be a movement because there's such alignment. And all resources are directed from the local church level which allows us to invest more in mission and ministry. And if you know anything about Asbury, uh, we just had what used to be called a global impact celebration. We have, we have 25 local mission partners, 25 global partners. We're, we're pouring a lot of money and energy into the globe already while still sending a half a million dollars off to a denomination. If we could pull that in and then begin to invest it that way, that was just a, a big deal to us. And then we believed it would have a significant appeal to younger people and leaders. Uh, I don't think this is highly debatable. You might disagree with me, and that's okay. But I think most people agree that we're in a post-denominational age. That doesn't mean denominations don't have a place. But we really have moved past. I mean, 
Uh, neither of my children go to a United Methodist Church. They, when they got married and moved to a town, they looked for a church that fit their needs. You don't just look for a certain shingle hanging outside. So we've kind of moved into this post-denominational world. What are the weaknesses if you were to go this route? And I'm going to talk more about this in a little bit, but I would just say this. You have a vulnerability because of the autonomy. You need to acknowledge that. We asked our leaders to listen to things like the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast. If you haven't done that, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and I, I say this, this is just me, but I think what happened with Mars Hill and Mark Driscoll, uh, our version of that in the United Methodist Church was some of our bishops who went rogue and couldn't be held accountable. So they're both kind of the same thing happening in two environments, but you definitely have a vulnerability in a network kind of situation or an independent kind of situation. There's a little bit of lack of clarity on how a network functions and is managed, and some of that's getting more clear, but some of it's just, you're likely to ask some questions today that I'm gonna go, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, that's just, we're in the early stages. Now, I'm a church planter, and I'm comfortable with that. You may not be. Our last membership class, I talked about how, when it comes to a network, we're building the plane as we fly it. And this one guy said, um, afterwards, he said, could you come over here? And I said, sure. And he said, you know, that doesn't go that well, building the plane as you fly it. <laughs> And I said, you're one of those guys in Huntsville who builds those planes, aren't you? I said, yeah, I, am. I really am. And so we talked through it for a while, and the good news for us is they joined, but we were just able to talk through how that could work and function, and how you can manage the ambiguity for a while until you get a little more stability. But absolutely, there's some lack of clarity, and, and that has to, you have to gauge your comfort level with that. It's like my wife and I, we obviously we have a financial planner, and you know, one of the first things a financial planner says is I want to gauge your comfort level with risk. Mine's like here and hers is like here. And so we invest right here, you know, so you have to just figure that out. Where's your comfort level? You need to understand that about your congregation. And then last of all, it is absolutely the most work on the front end. You've got to do things like develop your faith and practices document. And if you go into a denomination, they give that to you. You may or may not like all of it, but they give it to you. So you don't have to develop it. So we chose a network. Why did we choose a network? Well, if I were to sum it up in two or three things, I would say number one, um, the apportionment issue was a big deal to us. Second of all, a leaner structure that allowed us, we believe, to recruit younger leaders. For example, we have a summer intern program, 10 people graduating high school about to go to college come and spend the summer with us and they take a look at what ministry might look like. We now have a year-round residency. We have three residents who are post-college spending a year with us deciding if they want to go into the marketplace as a missionary or go into vocational ministry. We're really committed at Asbury to the next generation of leaders. We felt like this environment helped us be more attractive. You might decide different, but we believe that. There are really four things that a church has to be able to do even to consider being part of a network or an independent church. One, you have to be able to self-organize. Now, you seem to be doing that right now, but I can't imagine there are not at least a few bumps in the road, right? Um, can I get an amen or get a witness? But anyway, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I preach camp meetings. I'll beg for an amen if I need to sometimes. <laughs> but you know, it's just the nature of trying to develop something. Can you self-organize? Can you self-generate? In other words, funding. I suspect you can. I'm looking around here. You got enough people. You can probably fund. I mean, if you're looking at buying this building already, you can probably do that. Third, are you self-sustaining and are you self-reflecting? So if I take those things, I would, I would kind of try to bring it together like this. If you're gonna be a, an independent church and part of a network, uh, there's nobody up here to manage things if things go off the rails, okay? 
Now, look, I'm pretty balanced on all this. Uh, we also, in some cases, were supposed to have some people up there managing things who didn't. And that's why we're here. So I simply say no human construct, whatever leadership construct you're in, can guarantee that it's safe from the fallen human nature, whether it's a denomination or an independent network. So that's just part of the reality. You can try to your best, and we're going to do that, but you can't guarantee it. Second of all, can you find your pastor? I'm currently, just because I'm friends and know folks, I'm helping two churches right now in their process of searching for someone. Because there's just nobody up here to do it. And they said, you at least used to appoint people. Would you help us work through this? And sure, I'll do that the best I can. And then third, and I'll... Uh, when you go this route, there's a real danger of theological drift. And, uh, and you, need to, you need to decide how you're gonna anchor your theology and what that theology is, okay? So let me, um, uh, last Thursday, we had our first gathering of a regional network. And I'm gonna talk about the foundry that you've heard about which is a more national network, and Forged, which is a network we're launching for this region in just a moment. But before I do that, if I were to say, okay, what are the big picture differences between a denomination and a network, and try to just simplify it, crystallize it the best I could. Here are some of the things I would say. First of all, it's hierarchy versus relationships. In a denomination, there's a prescribed hierarchy. There are bishops, there are DSs. Sometimes that's worked well. I've benefited from that, you know? I mean, when I was 18 years old, I was appointed to serve a church. I mean, it was a small church. <laughs> Didn't pay out a lot. And uh, a lady sitting right back here thought that she wasn't speaking as loud as she was, but her daughter had come and she was speaking to her daughter and she said, oh my Lord, they sent a kid to be our pastor. <laughs> and I look back today and I go, oh my Lord, they sent a kid to be their pastor. <laughs> but you know, if you have six members, you can't mess it up that bad, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but, but along the way, I was given a chance to plant a church. I mean, it, 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 was, it was my family, my living room. I mean, it, that was the start, but it was something that gave me an opportunity. I've never been anything until now other than a United Methodist. And so uh, I would just say to you all, I know you're at a different phase. You've already made that decision. But this was painful in a lot of ways for me. You know, there was a lot sacrificed in some ways along the way. But a denomination functions like that. There was a prescribed hierarchy. Networks really are all about relationships. So it is a voluntary, cooperative association of like-minded, common-hearted pastors and congregations. So relationships matter. It's built on trust. You know, as Stephen Covey said, speed of trust. And here's the thing. I mean, I'm looking around. I don't think I know anybody that well here. And a couple of you I know, okay. But I don't know that you know me enough to know if you can trust me, right? And so in a denomination, you don't worry as much about that because you know there's some people who maybe you don't trust or you don't have to get to know, but it doesn't matter as much. In a network, you need to know that these are people that we want to do life with. You know, that's, a, that's somebody, that's a church that I want to walk with, I want to journey with, I want to be a part of that with these folks. Uh, and what about accountability? That's always one of the top questions, right? How, what about accountability? Well, in the denomination, again, it's prescribed accountability based on this hierarchy. Bishops, DSs, boards of ordained ministry. In a network, and this is really important, the local church holds its leaders accountable. That's the role of the local church. Leaders of the network maintain theological integrity. And, uh, but local churches can invite network leaders in to being part of that. So let me just give you an example. We haven't, Asbury decided to, uh, to, decided to use the um, uh, book of discipline until we have our own faith and practices document. 
So we're in process. We're working on that now. So I can't speak authoritatively. This is what we've done or are going to do because our board will decide that. But what I'm going to recommend is at least when it comes to the chair I occupy for the lead pastor, if there is a moral failure, if there's accountability, if that person retires or if it comes time to replace that person for any other reason, I'm going to ask them to have two pastors from the network that sit on the SBRC for that role. Because I believe outside voice and perspective is helpful in those moments. So it gives you the outside voice, but it can't overwhelm your committee. And we'll see if our church decides to do that. But it is, it is by invitation. Finally, money. Show me the money, right? <laughs> well, the money, denominations about apportionments. Uh, network is about voluntary partnerships. So that's what it's about. So let me give you five keywords. Here they are. One is independent. If you go this route, you have to see yourself and you have to be comfortable functioning in an independent manner. Okay? Second key word is relational. We, we don't believe, I don't believe in the Wesleyan family that we believe in total independence. We believe in relationships. So whether that's through a denomination or a network of like-minded people, we need those relationships. It's voluntary. Right? You're going to make a decision if you want to be part of the network. Uh, you know, that's up to you. That's your decision. Nobody's going to make that decision for you. It's theological. There's alignment around what I would say is classic Orthodox Wesleyan theology. That's what we're committed to. And then it's lean. It's providing an opportunity for as many of the resources to remain in the local church as possible. So, two networks I want to just briefly tell you about, and then I'm going to just take a break and see what questions you have. The Foundry Network, which a lot of people have heard about, is a relational network for large churches. Okay? So, currently, uh, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11... There's about 11, 12 churches in the foundry. They're all, you know, the, the minimum threshold is a church of 800 or more, but most of these churches, most are over 2,000 like Asbury. And, um, and there's not a desire for this to be really large because the relationships have to be strong. Uh, we all have to have deep relationships with each other. However, one of the things that churches who've become part of the foundry committed to was beginning to develop a more regional network that doesn't have that size component. It has the theological component, it has the relational component. The churches don't have to kind of meet up with that size component. And so we, last Thursday uh, at Asbury, we hosted the first meeting of what's called the Forge Network of Churches. So churches were there kicking the tires, you know, not sure what they'll ultimately decide. Many of them have made a decision. Some of them have not. But there were 14 churches who were part of that. Uh, one church out of Auburn, one church out of Montgomery. The rest of those churches were in what used to be the North Alabama Conference. And we are going to meet quarterly to do life together and to hold each other accountable. And I've given, I didn't have enough of these. I knew for everybody here, but I brought a number of them, gave them to some of your leadership. They can make copies. You can get a look at them. But it gives the basic theological foundation and the basic affirmations you would make if you wanted to be part of the Forge Network of Churches. If you affirm those things, either as a pastor or ideally as pastor in church, then you're part of it, you know. Now, when it comes to the foundry, it's a little more uh, robust in terms of not only do you meet these criteria, but we've got to get to know each other well enough to know if we want to do life together. So before Asbury was part of it, I went to Atlanta. I spent several days with the guys. We hung out. We talked. We prayed. They heard my story. I heard theirs. You know, a handful of them I knew well. A few of them I did not know that well. And we decide, yeah, we want, to, we want to try to affect the kingdom of God together. So.
So, uh, so they said yes to us coming in and later Cove in our region, us and Cove are part of uh, the foundry and together we're helping start Forge, which is this regional network. And um, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions about that. It might be easiest for me to try to field some of those. So I think I'll just stop there. You know, I've got more paperwork if you want presentation, but that's not the way I like to function. Hopefully that's giving you a little bit of the lay of the land, and I'm happy to field questions. Or say, hey, I just don't know the answer to that question. Or that's still in process. I'll shoot straight with you. So, anybody have a question? Do you, you still want to come to the microphone? As long as we can hear them, that's fine. Okay. All right. Anybody? What are the affirmations? The affirmations are these. <laughs> so, I'll make sure I get them all right. Number one, if you. Um, if you are a church becoming part of this, you have disaffiliated or you're a new church plan, which you obviously qualify for. You're not currently a member of another denomination or network. The reason for that is we believe churches need to be all in wherever they are. None of us are in competition with each other. When we decided this route, the first two calls I made were to Keith Cowart and and you know, to all those leaders and said, hey, and they kept the door open. One of the benefits of going this route is it's the easiest pivot. You get two or three years down the road and you go, that's not working exactly the way we thought. The doors are open to go in the other directions. Affirm your commitments to the basic theological standards and they are, they are primarily taking, taken straight from uh, the um, Book of Discipline I'll give you some of those affirmations, and they're some of the same classic creeds. So the EUV Confession of Faith, the Articles of Religion of the Methodist Church, the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed are the primary foundational theological components. Uh, beyond that, or, or contained within that, are we believe that Jesus is way, truth, and life. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. We strive for ministry full of grace and truth. Priority is the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. As my friend Brian Collier loves to say, if it's good for the kingdom, it's good for us. If it's good for us, it isn't necessarily good for the kingdom. So we prioritize the kingdom over ourselves at all moments, or the best we can. We're committed to reach people that no one else is reaching. We're committed to relational discipleship. We're engaged in being the hands and feet of Christ in our communities. We affirm the sovereignty of God to gift all believers according to his will to equip the saints. And then we affirm that marriage and sexual intimacy are good gifts from God in keeping with the teachings of scripture historically. And throughout the church universal, we believe that marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman in a single exclusive union. We believe that God intends faithfulness in marriage and celibacy and singleness. That became the presenting issue, obviously, the denomination, and we felt like we needed to speak to that. So those are the affirmations and the foundational documents that help provide the core. Does that, does that make sense? Exactly. Yes. Okay. I mean, and this is available to you. That's really that component of it, but, but it's got those attached. For us at Asbury, uh, like I said, if if our board affirms what I'm hoping they will, we're adding one other component to that, and that's Wesley's 52 standard sermons as part of our theological foundations. Without that, you're All right, well, that's where we're headed. I hope. I, know, I never speak for the board until they speak for themselves, but that's what I'm encouraging them to do. I saw a hand. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. So let me make sure I get this straight. You consider yourself non denominational I would not say that. I, we consider ourselves Wesleyan and Methodist, but we are independent. Now that might seem nuanced to you, but for us we are totally Wesleyan and Methodist in our core theology and DNA. But if you had completely dropped the word Methodist from like the It was never in their time. They've always been as Yeah, it, it was Methodist has never been in their title. Yeah. 
before I got there, um, Methodist was not on our sign and all, but yes, in our disaffiliation process, Methodist, like, like some churches, um, Hartzell, it's Hartzell First Methodist now, instead of First United Methodist, would be an example. We don't have Methodist in our name, that's correct. But one of the things we said to our congregation, and this is a little bit of the trust factor and a little bit of the building, the plane while you're flying it, but, you know, we, we said we are always going to be Methodist, we're just not going to be United Methodist, and we are, even though it's not in the name and all, that's our core. DNA, and one of the ways we're going to do that is in our faith and practices document. The theology component is going to be um, for all time; it cannot be changed. And so, several of the churches in the Foundry Network have done that. Part of their part of their faith and practices, part of their discipline, cannot be changed. Part of it can be changed with a two-thirds vote, because some of the structure in that. Well, we have ours that can't change any of our Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, especially in an independent world, one of your biggest challenges really is around theology. I've got some good friends who planted a church in a, another city, and they've had, they've had uh, two splits over theology. So you just need to know, if there's nobody up here overseeing that, you need to do a good job of anchoring that. If you're highly committed to it, and I and Asbury are highly committed to our West End roots, uh, that needs to be good. The church is two years in and decides it's not for them. What's the procedure and price for the exit? From the network, yes. there's no price to come in or get out. Any procedure to leave? Just tell us you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you leave, if you leave the roots of theology, we will ask you to go. And, uh, but, but we don't hope that will happen anytime soon. And the same is true if we think you leave the roots of theology. You can, absolutely. Right now, you have a hard time doing that because us and Cove are the leadership board, but <laughs> we will eventually share that leadership. But yeah, absolutely. If anybody leaves historic, Orthodox Wesleyan theology, this isn't the place for them. Absolutely. Yes, sir. You mentioned theological drift. So I'm assuming any church that comes to you to be a member of the network they have to have their faith and practices document approved by they don't. What they within this document that I shared with you, there's a there are these these basic things that I listed to you are in this document, and your affirmation is we affirm those. And so you might be like where we are. We're still living under the discipline, but we affirm that, and we will abide by that. So you don't have to have it finalized, but you have to affirm that. Others? What um, is what is the differences of us staying like we are? We're not affiliated with anyone and join the network. What's the difference in that? What benefits do we get? What's that? What, what's the value add? Yeah, I know sometimes they're all Yeah. I would say this. If you are staying totally independent, you don't have the benefit of the relational accountability and the multiplied ministry that could happen within a network. And like an example would be? Yeah, and that's uh, one example would be when um, I use this one a good bit. When the orchard decided to disaffiliate, they had a, they're an incredible church with multiple campuses. But what they did not do a lot of was global ministry. So Brian reached out to me because Asbury has such a heartbeat for that, and said, "Would you recommend three uh, possible candidates that we partner?" And now we, along with the Orchard, are partnered with ILI, International Leadership Institute, uh, Wes Griffin, Jimmy Acock, in doing ministry uh, to um, folks who have um, come into Europe from places like Iran and Iraq and that kind of thing, helping them build leaders and plant churches. 
So there's the partnership there. There's the mutual shared practices when you get together to meet. Like every, we come together quarterly and at those quarterly meetings, somebody's gonna be sharing best practices. And one of your commitments is to be like, if we work together, one of the commitments I'm making to you and you're making to me is total availability. So if you bump up against something that's you're struggling with, then you know you have a group of other churches that you have access to. So you can benefit from that. Those are some of the biggest things I would say are in there. What does your quarterly gathering look like? Are you talking about those at every congregation in your network? You know, all meeting at the Asbury campus? Yeah. Two days worth of meetings and small groups? Or how does that? Well, we've had one of those. Yeah. <laughs> how that one? Uh, well, everybody, I can tell you, it was different from what they will always be, but people, I mean, I got a lot of phone calls. We spent an hour, hour and a half in worship and prayer together. We prayed for each other. We did accountability over lunch. We asked the how is it with your soul questions over lunch. And then before lunch, I kind of did this. Here's what we're talking about. Get around your table, ask any questions after lunch. We let every church speak into what they would want this to be. When you say every church, you mean the whole congregation came from the No, uh, it was everything from some churches had their pastor to some churches had 10 lay people. Everybody's invited, but not everybody's going to come. So it, it's, and, and you can be a pastor and be part of the network uh, if your church doesn't, but, but the goal is everybody do it together. So yeah, we had, I'd have to look, but I think we had about including our some of our staff that was there about 65 people 70 people so could you speak about eligibility for a little bit because we're not quite at the 100 to a thousand uh, members just yet sure um so we don't really meet the, the, the level that we need to actually join the council but you talked about bringing other smaller churches in would we qualify and let's just be honest, would you pay us? <laughs> well, if you paid us enough. No, yes. <laughs> let, me, let me make sure, because this sometimes, uh, maybe I don't do as good a job explaining this. The foundry does have a component of certain size of churches. The network we're starting, Cove and Asbury starting called Forged, is a regional network and it does not have that component to it. Okay. So if you affirm those things and you want to be part of it, yes. And so we have we had the pastors from Bethsaida Hills there and we had a church of 25. You know, I mean this network this network will have a lot of variety to it and then back to what your question earlier, most future meetings, we believe. Two things came out of this first meeting. We want to connect all of our like-minded ministry folks. So our kids people want to connect with each other, our student ministry folks. So we're gonna begin facilitating that. Uh, and then, then every time we gather, we're going to have the opportunity to do some kind of best practices. So we're gonna be sending something out to all the churches saying, what do you think you do really well? What could we all benefit from? And so we have one pastor who's already has a real heart for uh, spiritual disciplines and all. And he says, I'd like to be involved in helping with that. So that's kind of how we'll begin to build out the meetings. But they'll have worship. They'll have accountability. Wesleyan accountability. How is it with your soul kind of thing. And they'll have times of prayer. And then there'll be best practices kind of stuff. And then hopefully there'll be like opportunities for people doing the same kind of ministry roles to connect. That's some of the basics right now. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned we have pastors that might be a part of the network uh, and certainly the church that's not. So I'm assuming you're going to credential new pastors. How do you have to do that? Uh, this is where you have to keep in mind independent. So we don't credential anybody. The local church is responsible for credentialing. 
A good example of that, uh, Cove just did this at their church, and they invited uh, Brian Collier and myself to come be part of that. So Brian preached a message. He and I asked the classic questions, and then their board laid hands on their folks. So that's a big shift in thinking. So that's a local church decision, what credentialing looks like. Can, can local churches go through this network to get just some very practical things like, you, let's say you need hymns. Mm -hmm. I mean, or, it, or you need Sunday school curriculum. Uh, or, or maybe just need places to get supplies at a better price. Clerical support, you know, those kinds of things. Does the network provide any of that kind of resourcing? They'll do a lot of infrastructure kind of work. Okay. Uh, now we we got a bunch of hymnals, so if you want some, <laughs> now's the time. <laughs> uh, we we decided to go with the new hymnal produced by Seabed and Urine. So that was the, that's our new hymnal, and uh, so we got stacks of the old hymnals and people are taking them and that kind of thing but there's still a bunch but we really we really like the work that was done by uh, dr Tennant's wife from asbury seminary and seedbed in your room we feel like the hymnal they produced is really excellent so that's the direction we go so what we can help for example bill Muntz, who's on our executive staff bill was an executive with kohler worked directly for Mr. Kohler for years. And so he handled everything legal and financial for us. So at our meeting the other day, I had Bill stand and say, hey, if you haven't finalized all that work, this is your guy. We're making ourselves available to you. So there's that kind of help. And we've pointed people to seatbed for some of their resources, but we're not currently producing anything uh, to help with that way. In the back, I see yeah, one, one of the things you mentioned a minute ago is you're in the process of helping other churches find ministers. Yes. Where would an independent church go look for an independent minister? Um, well, right now, uh, I think one of these churches has landed on their person, so we're just trying to close the deal right now. But it, it's a search. Uh, so... For example, one of the churches I encouraged to bring in uh, a Methodist Wesleyan consulting search company, and they're helping them do that. Uh, I, I helped put a list together of 10, 12 people and gave it to them, and they're vetting it, and they've got a, bunch, a lot where, more. Where did, those, where did those 10 or 12 people come from? Relationships. What churches? I can't tell you. Part of this process now is to protect their identity until they know if they're going to be chosen. But they all, I would say all of these have a, all of them have a United Methodist background. But I would say you have an option as a church if you want to use, depends on who you want to use to help search and how wide your search you want to be. Or things like uh, reaching out to Brian Collier at the Orchard. They have they have um, a larger residency program, so they have about ten residents every year. And we just hired one. We hired Sally Kate from them. They said that she was one of their two best. And I said, well, we need that person. So that's why I use the word relational so much. The relationships matter. They become a key factor and how this functions as well. So, so they all, all are United Methodist pastors in the Southeast, I would say that. And that's part of what, I do a little consulting with one of these companies and that's one of our commitments that if you are in the process, we guard your identity until you say, I'm okay. So you do not go to the assembly. <laughs> You can, yeah. I was, I was just up at Asbury recently. I took a prospective student up, and I talked to a few people while I was up there. I mean, there, and I would also say this. 
our conference has not been doing this, but most United Methodist, or many, let me say it this way, many United Methodist conferences throughout the country are already using search firms. So that is not uncommon. I mean, that's how our executive pastor, Chris Montgomery, got picked up and went to pray. The guy called me up, said, I'd like to talk to him. Sure. So this is the world we're moving in, whether you're in a denomination or not, it's going to have a lot more of that in it. And that's just going to be part of the dynamic, I would say. But yes, seminaries, relational dynamics, some of these companies that help handle it, that kind of thing would be places you would turn. Yes, sir? Speaking of relationships and strength in numbers, is there a way that Forge can leverage their numbers in order to help us as an individual church provide better benefits to our clergy? Yeah. We've been getting that question, and right now the honest <laughs> answer is it's not. that's not planned. And part of it is um, we currently are not planning on this being a formal 501c3. Uh, so it's just a relation. It, it could develop into that. That could happen, but right now it's not that. And uh, But we also, I don't know, we had three churches ask us this time about doing um, background checks. We gave them all the information on how they could do background. So they, they have that information. It's just up to them to do it. We're not leveraging that. Now, background checks is an interesting one. We're, we're in conversation with the company that we use to try to see if more churches started using them, we could get better prices. But there's no guarantee of that. Yes, ma'am. Just, and I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, so forgive me, but just remember, you would be functioning as an independent church. So you would make that choice. If you want them to go, your, your group would handle that. If you don't want them to go, nobody's going to come in and make them go anywhere. Now, somebody <laughs> might come and hire them. <laughs> That's part of the world we're living in, but it's not going to be forced upon you in any way. What would the relationship be for a congregation to join your group of fours to the congregation? Yeah, that's a good question. We got that uh, Thursday, so I hadn't anticipated that uh, as much. Yes, yeah, let me, I'm sorry about that. I should have done that. The question is, what is the relationship between the Forged Regional Network, if you're in that, and the Foundry? And it's really twofold. Number one, it is the relationship is through uh, through Asbury and Cove because we're part of that and we're starting this. But the second thing, which I'm really excited about, most if not all the churches right now are very involved in New Room every year. And I don't know if you know a lot about New Room. What? New Room is a gathering of um, mostly Wesleyan churches that came out of the seedbed um, effort. And so we are going to put a day on the front end of that. And so all the foundry churches and any of the forged churches that want to gather together will meet for a day before uh, the New Room Conference every year. So that will begin to build a broader connection. There's no formal, there's no formal connection between the two, but that's a way that will kind of expand the connection. And, and, uh, and we are big believers we're just huge believers in New Room, and uh, so we want to keep growing that as well. So that's a way to do that. And if you're not uh, if you're not familiar with it, just Google New Room Conference. Yes, sir. Do you see the New Room Conference developing into a denomination? No. And I can speak pretty definitively because we tried to get them to. <laughs> John Tanner and I went up and really asked them, would you be the covering for all this? And they said, that's not our calling. Our calling is to provide for, to sow for a great awakening among the greater church and especially the greater Wesleyan family. 
So they have no plans to do that. We thought they would be the perfect people to do it, but wisely, they, chose, they were right, they, but they just chose not to do that. Yes? May I ask uh, the reason that you didn't feel to go to Brooklyn? Yeah, as, as I said earlier, for us, it felt like it was the apportionments would be too high ultimately and the structure would be too close to what we were leading. So for some people that that the structure is actually what they want. For us, we felt like that was hindering some of the things we'd like to do. So that's really <laughs> primarily it. Sorry to ask you many questions. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, we're in a healing time. I want to be, be totally transparent and honest. We don't anticipate that being a shift we will ever make, but we work very hard to keep the door open. And I, like I said, the, the first calls I made were to the leaders of the Global Methodist Church at the time. It wasn't the Global Methodist Church. Oddly enough, the day we had our vote to disaffiliate was the day the Global Methodist Church launched. That just happened. So it didn't even exist while we were going through the process. I mean, it had a logo and it was supposed to happen, but it hadn't. Uh, so my first calls were to say, hey, is that door open? And they are. So we believe it is. And uh, I have a saying for our folks, uh, you know, I don't believe in riding a dead horse. So if things aren't working, we'll dismount. We'll do something different. But we don't anticipate that. So I want to be very transparent and clear with that. Anyone else? Yes? You may have already said this, but um, after your church decided to disaffiliate, how long did you wait before you decided which way you were going to go? We did it in one vote. Our vote was to disaffiliate and become part of the Foundry Network. And there were reasons for that for us, but uh, it was one vote. You know, Brian Collier, they said they were going to take six months to evaluate it, and it's been five or six years. And he, he, his image was, we're not going to get out of one marriage and jump right into another. Hmm. So he believed there's some value in giving yourself some time. But for us, we felt like, uh, just felt like for our church, that decision would have been the one that might be most fraught with danger. So our board decided we're going to make a recommendation to the church and they can vote it up or down. And so that's what we ended up doing. You're in a different spot. I recognize that. But so Brian's situation might be a little closer. And they decided to wait at least six months and they're kind of still there. Yes, sir. About in your opinion, I wanted to ask you, why do you think the Global Church is the way they're meeting from 2023 to 2024? It seemed to me that that would be so important to have that meeting this year to establish and vote on the things that we're talking about. Uh, so I was curious as to your thinking about that. Yeah, I don't know. I would agree with you. As a matter of fact, we were told it was going to be 25, and then they moved it back to 24 because I think they're seeing that reality. I think there is a danger for churches that move into an independent reality, waiting for that to happen, to just stay there. They'll see some benefits. So 
but but I'm sure I'm not in their seat. I can't imagine all the complexity of starting a whole new denomination. So I'm sure there are reasons, but I, I would agree I was surprised they were waiting as long as they did. But I don't know all the reasons. I, I've talked to Keith Boyd a little bit about it, and it's just a complexity issue for sure. Anyone else? I'd like to say it a little different. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, first of all, I don't speak for the Global Methodist Church. Here's what I do know. They have a transitional book of discipline that they're operating under, and they have not had a convening conference. And so it, my way of looking at it, until there's a convening conference, we don't know for sure do I believe the transitional book of discipline will be primarily what they adopt? Yes. But you've also got to realize that I've been a delegate to two general conferences. You get in those meetings and you just never know what's going to happen. So, so I'm not at all, I want you to hear, I'm not at all speaking negatively about them. The facts are they have a transitional book of discipline. They have some bishops who are helping oversee the process. They have local leaders who are functioning like DSs, but they have not had a convening conference. And until the convening conference happens, it's not formal in my way of looking at it. I hope that makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to kind of, so it's not, I hope you don't hear me being disparaging, not at all. It's just, to me, that's the reality of where they are. And I hope, I would have hoped they would have done that. Even after we made the decision to go somewhere in another direction, I talked to Keith Boyette. And I said, I, I would encourage you but, to move quicker, but they have reasons that they're waiting. And I understand that. Uh, that makes sense. What, you mentioned something about the 5013C and the y'all were not going down that road or hadn't decided what what is your reasoning well right now it's 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 much more of an informal relational network uh, now the foundry is does have that the regional network uh, i'll be honest i did not anticipate 14 churches on thursday so i'm having to back up and go up there might be more desire for this than I anticipated. And it may shape our thinking as we go along. Um, but right now, that's not a goal. We don't intend to take money. We don't intend to have staff, all those kind of things. So let's say we, um, is it is Decatur Methodist? What, what is this church being called? Decatur Methodist? Okay. Let's say Decatur Methodist and Asbury start, decided to partner on something, uh, a global mission project, or we're gonna plant a church somewhere, whatever. One of us would take the lead on that, and so that's where the resources would be handled and all that, But so there doesn't have to be an organization to do that. So that's part of our thinking. Right now. All right, folks, we're, uh, we're an hour and five minutes in, I don't, I was going to say I don't have any place to be, I do, but I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> but I want to respect your time, so uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or if you feel like we've exhausted our time, I'm happy to do that as well. If any more questions? I was going to say, if there's something later that somebody wants to ask, is there a way to contact you that we can should we funnel it up through? Yeah, absolutely. The, the okay. easiest way... Uh, is just to send an email to me or my assistant, Lori, and uh, you can get those on the website, and some of the folks here are doing that. And uh, we're happy to, we'll do our best to respond to anything that would be helpful. And I was gonna say on the pamphlet or 
brochure, I'm not yeah. sure, just, you know, whatever. We've got some copies, but we're going to have to probably have to make at least another hundred. So we'll, we'll try to get busy on that and have those available by, by Sunday. Was there any way you could make that in the PDF and just email it to everybody? Uh, I think my assistant is looking at that and may have done that today, if not by tomorrow. I can't. But I think there's somebody that might be doing that. <laughs> I can tell you right now, I don't have we the can, to do that. We can do that and put it on Facebook. We should be able to do that. I yeah. Think. If but you're okay with us putting it online, website, we can do that. Yeah. There's nothing we're going to look it up. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll send her a text just to make sure we're working on that. Anything else? Anything else just pressing before I... Did you get an update on your daughter? I haven't gotten anything yet, mm -hmm. which uh, concerns me a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, it just came through as you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> God, torn, torn meniscus, torn something else, everything's fixed. It's going to be a while before she walks, but everything's yeah. good. So, <laughs> yes, amen. Hey. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to Jack to close us out here tonight. I thank you all for being here. I hope that this was informational and helpful. I think it probably was. Answer a lot of questions. And uh, so anyway, uh, Jack, if you will, if you would close us. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity to be here, to hear uh, from what you're doing in churches and in your work, Father, we pray for wisdom and, and leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit to discern your perfect will for each one of us individually, but also corporately as a church. And so, Father, we pray that uh, you will uh, provide that, and we trust that you will. Father, we thank you for this evening. Uh, we pray for Asbury. We thank you for what they're doing for your glory, and we pray that you will continue to bless their pastor and their staff and their church and all that they're doing uh, in your cause. Father, be with us as we leave this place. Keep us safe and uh, allow us to be the ambassadors you've called us to be of your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.